of Indira Gandhi National Open University, New Delhi. He is presently Garnet of India's nominee in the eminent persons group set up by the Prime Ministers of India and Nepal. He was bestowed full professorship at a relatively young age of 39 by India's premier Jawaharlal Nehru University. Acclaimed as the architect of the reopening of the historic Nathula trade route, Sikkim, in India and Tibet's autonomous region in China after 44 years in 2006, he has served as a member of the High Level National Committee to examine the six scheduled areas in Northeast region, a member of the National Committee to revamp Northeastern Council, and a member of Prime Minister's Task Force on Hill and Mountain Development in 2008. Third is the recipient of a large number of awards, public felicitations, including Father's Cochart Gold Medal, Lifetime Achievement Award by St. Joseph's College, Darjeeling, and has been associated with a number of national and international organizations. He has participated in over 500 seminars and conferences both in India and in 35 countries abroad and has supervised the dissertation and thesis from over 45 M. and PhD students who all hold prestigious positions across the globe. So, we are delighted to have you here with us. I call upon Professor Mahindra P. Lama with his valedictory address titled Beyond Theories. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh... Very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, uh, Professor Sukanya Sama, Professor Bodhi Shadwa Shengupta, Professor Mithilesh Jha, and uh, all the very distinguished researchers and participants in this very, very interesting collaborations. Well, uh, I have been teaching uh, in uh, a number of programs across uh, India and also a number of countries abroad, primarily looking into or examining theories and uh, implications and the practicality of these theories. And gradually over the years, I have come to realize that <clears throat> theories per se would not give you the entire or would not tell you the entire story, right? If you strictly or if you very meticulously follow theory, you may not get conclusions or the what you call the relevant <clears throat> research outputs. Uh, that's why many of us in the university system today would like to go much beyond theories, taking into considerations about what really happens in the political economy, in the cultural ecology. Of course, also the fact that uh, research has started becoming increasingly <clears throat> policy oriented, <clears throat> and uh, many people do ask for what you call what you call the social relevance of the research we conduct in the university system and it could be across the disciplines but more so it is in the social sciences and humanities uh, other day i was visiting two very well-known private universities now in Delhi. One is uh, Asoka, including Asoka University and uh, O.P. Jindal University. And I found both these universities emphasizing on greatly on liberal arts, primarily based on science and scientific tenors. And uh, when I was uh, Conversing with the authorities there and the faculty members there, they did tell me that 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 uh, that research is particularly in the humanities and social sciences need to be much more policy focused and much more socially relevant. I'm going to discuss today about uh, three situations realistic situations where 
somehow, if you strictly go by the theoretical underpinnings, we may not really achieve something which we tend to or which we would like to achieve as far as the results are concerned. I raise uh, three critical issues. One of the theories that bind human security and national security. Secondly, I would also look into the theories that uh, guide or that to a large extent determine the cause of regionalism in a particular region. And thirdly, I would like to speak on uh, situations where diplomacy is conducted, right? Say, for example, on something like hydro diplomacy and how various theories uh, tend to converge, yet theories may not lead to, theories alone may not lead to a situations where we can really negotiate and discuss. So let me start with human security and national security discourse. You know, both these discourses have become pretty interesting. National security, all of us know, is a kind of an orthodox variety of security, basically, basically triggered by what you call a country's national security interest. And it primarily comes from a theoretical understanding that global world or the international system is anarchic in nature. And once it is anarchic in nature, a state has to be omnipresent, right? Omnipotent also. And a state has to be strong militarily in order to determine the national interest of a particular country. And this is what you call a realist paradigm or a realist theory. So therefore, uh, in the national security discourse, the state is the core element. But on the other hand, we have a discourse parallel, which is much more relevant today also, which is equally important also, known as human security discourse. Unlike the national security discourse, where realist paradigm drives one to believe that state is the key actor, that means the entire system is state-centric, in the cause of human security, it is basically entire discourse is human now, the moment you say national security discourse, you talk about border as a geometric line. One whoever crosses that border impinges upon the security of sovereignty of another country, and that's why you need to have a national security. I'm giving you an example from nearby our country or our, our countries around. But if you talk about human security, Right, human security is is a challenged or human security is threatened from ten different angles. It could be food, it could be personal security, it could be natural disaster, it could be communal riots, it could be what you call it uh, um, environmental insecurity, it could be energy insecurity, it could be challenged from ten different action, uh, um, angles, unlike national security, right? So if you bring in the entire discourse of the theories of security, national security into human security, it really does not tell you the entire story. That's why we tend to do, we tend to become more specific about human security and we tend to bring theories brought about by Copenhagen school or Canadian school or even Japanese school, right? Where you have 10 different angles of looking into a term known as security. Let me give you an example. We have communal rights. 
height and we have pandemics. At the same time, we have Kargil War and we have Chinese intrusion into Indian borders. And if you look at it, look into the characteristic features of both these phenomena. One is absolutely dealing with human security. The other one is we are putting in the bracket of national security, right? And if you look into the characteristics features of both these security issues, then you will find one is more or less akin to another. For example, if you look into these events, say, for example, you take communal riots or a pandemic on the one hand, and if you take Kargil war or Chinese intrusion into the Indian borders, then you will find both these phenomena killed, phenomena killed, displaced a large number of people. Both destroyed property and caused huge losses to exchequer. Brought both created serious human insecurity and central security forces, including the army, were deployed in both the situations. And they were extensively covered by media, mainly widely discussed in parliament, and uh, both to a large extent followed what you call the commissions of, with the commissions of inquiry. So, Despite this striking similarities, why communal riots and pandemics are internal security? And why Chinese intrusion into Indian territories and Kargil war are what you call is national security? That means one, the moment you call it internal security, it becomes a law and order problem. Whereas the moment you call it a national security means it becomes a kind of a serious national security issue. Is this because pandemics and uh, communal rights took place within the region, within the country, and the Kargil and the Chinese intrusion took place that involved a country outside the border? If you look into the theories of security, it would only explain as to why Kargil and Chinese intrusion would become a national security threat. And if it would and it would not explain why pandemics and communal riots would not be a national security threat. Because Theoretically, we have defined national security or orthodox security in a very, very tight framework of realist paradigm. So if you really into, if you really get into the debate of security, and if you really get into the debate of, of, of what you call it, analyzing security and understanding security, then we as scholars will be at a loss if we really go strictly by what you call the orthodox security theories and do not really bring into consideration these theories or, or the realities that affect human security. Please remember, in case of pandemic, it did not respect national sovereignties. It did not respect, it disregarded the national borders. Therefore, but do you call, even if did not respect national borders, national sovereignty, do you really call pandemic a kind of a national security issue? Why do you call pandemic a purely internal security issue or a purely internal problem? What is the distance between internal security problem and national security problem. Would the theories really explain this? 
There is a cross-border environmental injuries. You have uh, Indus flood. You have Koshi flood. You have Brahmaputra flood, right? Which has a huge trans-border character, right? Which has a huge involvement of the partners outside the borderlands for the borders. Even then, why it is not a national security concern? Therefore. The crux in the entire explanation of this dilemma in un understanding security from a much, much larger perspective is because we are trained, because we are cultivated to talk about national security from a particular theoretical perspective, basically for Yang's paradigm. Therefore, over the years, what we have realized, some of us, we have been working on not geometric line, border as a geometric line, but we are when we are discussing about borderland as an opportunity, then we suddenly come to know that the national security theories would not really explain the nuances of borderland management opportunities in these borders, or any kind of cross-border intrusions minus that of military. Therefore, I would say that uh, increasingly, the increasingly we need to really bring in newer theories. These theories may not be available in your in our textbooks, right? Primarily, this may not be able, these theories may not be available easily in the in the in the in the what you call it western literature therefore many of us as academics would have to develop our own theoretical discourses as far as our own theoretical understanding of what really happens in and around us my second submission about why theories we need to go beyond theories we have practiced regionalism in this part of the country, this, this part of the region fairly extensively. We have today a South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SAR. We have BIMSTEC. We have IORC. We are uh, the Mekong Cooperation Project. We are Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal. Several projects are going on. On top of that, Asian Development Bank is doing sub-regionalism project and all. Now, at the heart of sub-regionalism project, right, or regionalism project, the theoretical discourses are primarily would 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 peer around the points something related to cooperation something related to competitions and something related to assistance and finally rivalry, right? So these are the four very important terms when you really talk about regionalism is concerned. So, but if you look into the entire regionalism, entire regionalism issues, then theoretically it guides you to three kinds of integration process because the ultimate aim of regionalism is to integrate physically uh, in terms of uh, economic exchanges, socially in terms of social interactions, and to a large extent institutional uh, uh, interdependence, such kind of things we look into. That means in a way, what we are saying is yesterday we were, we were uh, all of us were acting as individual countries, but in the course of next 10 years, when the integration process starts or the cooperation process enlivens, then in that case, we will all be together making a decision together in many, many areas of cooperation. And that's how most of the regionalism processes would say this. Now, if you look into the theories of regionalism processes, then it basically moves into three varieties of theories. The market integration part, first we will market do market integration, then we'll do 
complex integration, and then we do what you call the functional integrations. And there are examples where uh, countries have come together and they have entered into first market integrations, moved into what you call it complex integrations, and finally to functional integrations. Now, if, if you follow this kind of integration process strictly and try to examine where we stand at, uh, as far as integration process in South Asia is concerned, you will find that we are nowhere as far as all these three integration processes are concerned. Because the market integrations will say that you will have to have intra-regional trade, that means regional trade of a much, much higher volume. Whereas well, in case of South Asia, out of our total global trade, trade within the region, that means trade within the eight South Asian countries, including Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, would be hardly 5%. If you see ASEAN countries, Association of Southeast Asian countries, if you see European uh, countries, U EU, if you see NAFTA, North American Free Trade Association, it would be much, much higher, going towards 40, 50 percent also, 30 to 50 percent also. But in South Asia today, after 40, almost 35 years of uh, regionalism process, our trade remains exactly at 5.5 percent of the global trade, inter region trade. So what does theory say about it, right? Theory says that we are at the lowest form of economic integration process. You move from what you call is preferential trading arrangement, then you go to free trade area, then from there you go to customs union, then the common market, then you go to what you call the economic union. And if you see EU, they have followed this path very, very strictly. And to a large extent, they have been successful, except phenomenon of Brexit, right? But in case of South Asia, if you follow this particular path, and if you try to explain the entire regionalism process in South Asia from what you call the yardstick of the theoretical pathways followed by European Union, then we'll be totally at a loss. We will not be able to explain situations precisely because we are not Europe, precisely because we don't have such matured institutions, precisely because our history is different, precisely because our communities are absolutely, they think differently than what many of the European communities would think together, right? Therefore, if you only follow the theories, then you may not be able to explain why we are a laggard as far as regionalism process is concerned in South Asia. How can you explain India playing uh, a pivotal role in the region? In Bimstake, India is a pivot. In Sark, India is a pivot. BBI and India is a pivot. Yes, yet it does not make any difference as far as regionalism process is concerned. Whereas if you see a pivot like Singapore, right? If you see a pivot like uh, Malaysia or France, Germany, UK, they have made a huge difference. Canada, US, Mexico, right? Therefore, what is very critical at this juncture is how do you explain, how do you explain that this, this very specific situations of what you call it withdrawal syndrome from regionality? 
how do you explain this long and protracted laggardness? Theoretically, right? That means if you don't have theoretical explanation for this, then you might have to, we might have to explain or find our own understanding about the theories. Because if you do not have, if you re really remain guided by what you call the standard given theories on regionalism, then we will be only saying that, look, we have not promoted ourselves from preferential trading arrangement to free trade or from free trade to, to, to customs union, right? That is what is, that is, that is that, and that would not explain the situations. That would not explain the situations where India would not like Pakistan to do anything meaningful, anything big, and at the same time, Pakistan would always do something that is against the interest of India, against the against the against India's determination to bring all the regional partners together. But theories would not explain this to a large extent. Therefore, some of us uh, working on these areas of cooperations and integrations have started to a large extent rethinking about the well-established theories on regionalism and integration process and see in, in, a, in a way, in what way it, 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 uh, it, 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 it could get or it could generate a new set of theories as far as regionalism in Southeast Asia is concerned. Because the model has failed. We have lock, stock, and barrel borrowed this theoretical model from some of the successful regionalism processes, but these models have become absolutely irrelevant to South Asian countries. My last uh, submission, as far as the gap between theories and the practices in South Asia is concerned is again what you call hydro diplomacy. All of us know that we have serious problems with neighboring countries as far as river water flows are concerned. Uh, we have Indus River problems with Pakistan. We have um, uh, Brahmaputra with China and to a large extent even Bangladesh. We have problems related to Koshi and Gandak with Nepal. We have problems related to Tista, right? And Ganges as far as uh, Bangladesh is concerned. So many of us, right? And uh, the practicing diplomats ask each other, how do you theoretically explain such kind of varied situations or such kind of behaviors among the neighboring countries? For example, if you go by the theoretical models, then what we find is basically what you find is basically the doctrine of absolute sovereignty. That is what we call common doctrine. Under this, the state has absolute rights to water flowing through its territory. Now, if that is the case, that is the case, then, uh, then uh, you can say that upper riparian like Bangla, like uh, China and upper riparian like India in case of uh, Brahmaputra or Ganges has the absolute what you call it sovereignty on the way it uses water. But is that the case? Is that how the international distribution of water or the international negotiation water takes place? So you come down to a much more moderated principles like doctrine of 
limited territorial sovereignty where you have reasonable and equitable use and obligations not to cause appreciable harm to other countries. Then you have purely orthodox economic theories where you talk about optimizations, right? And uh, you have game theories where you call, we talk about strategic choice and a zero sum game. And when you really talk about the negotiation theories, you talk about uh, what you call the multi track diplomacy. So you have, on the one hand, you have very interesting theories basically developed out of a number of such kind of issues and programs and problems across the globe. And they have acquired theories that can be possibly applicable to many other regions also. But in South Asia, right, it's difficult to really exactly implement these theories and say that these theories explain the real situations in South Asia. For example, in 20, I was, when I was teaching in China, uh, I happened to go to a Kailas Man Sarovar region, right? And I just wanted to see how the entire water tower dynamics work in China as far as the western part of China is concerned, southwestern part of China is concerned. Because I knew to a certain extent how it impinges upon the water flows down below in India and further to a state like Bangladesh. So when you go to southwestern part of China, your major concern is how to divert water resources from highlands to lowlands, from water scarce states like uh, what you call it, uh, dry 11 states, including Beijing and Shanghai and Tianjin, right? And these dry 11 states contribute almost 50% of GDP of China, right? And uh, they are basically, they are basically what you call it, uh, states that, that, that consume a lot of water because of their agricultural systems, because of their industrial systems and all. So the debate in China is, how do you divert Yangtze River, right, from the mountains, to the to the to, to the south uh, from the mountains going down to the south and how do you divert how do you take that water further to the north so that means what you are saying is basically let river, uh, river flow let the let this 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 particular river flows uh, flow upwards right Yangtze go to to Tianjin to what you call it Peking and Shanghai. So that is the debate about here in China. And when you go to really the entire stretch of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Gansai, Sikatse, uh, Nori, and all these places, you will find large number of tributaries of, 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 uh, of uh, Yarlum Sanko, that is Brahmaputra drying up. Now, Theoretically, as far as diplomacy is concerned, right, as far as distribution of water is concerned, the lower riparians should be getting adequate amount of, adequate quantum of water. But you have the case of glaciers behaving in a different manner. You have a case of tributaries drying up and you have a case of water diversion so what will the countries down below in the in the in the in other south asian countries do right now we have theories that to a certain extent explain the behavior of the upper riparians 
right? But it does not really get into the complexity of behavior of a country like China. For example, how no theoretical underpinnings could really explain why a particular country, right, monopolizes or captures and 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 does not want to does not want to share or disseminate any information, any knowledge about the water flows in that particular country. Right? Unless you have such kind of phenomenon, you will you will not be able to really explain. Come down to India. We have uh, we have uh, a situations where it would be very difficult for us to explain theoretically why India has a problem with Bangladesh, why India has a problem with Nepal, why India has a problem with Pakistan as far as water river, uh, as far as river waters uh, flow, uh, flow are concerned. You have a phenomenon of dominant actor, where the state is the actor. You have a phenomenon of subnational actor, like uh, what you call it uh, in case of uh, Ganges, you have a subnational actor like Bengal or the leadership in Bengal who determine actually the national policy as far as water flow to Bangladesh is concerned. And you have a quiet actor, right? A quiet actor like Tista, right? Where 80% of the Tista water flows through Sikkim but Sikkim just does not talk about entire negotiations process with Bangladesh, right? And you have a strong periphery actor, including the farmers' organizations, including the trade unions, and all these things. And in the entire theoretical discourse about water sharing, water diplomacy, it hardly takes into account all these what you call subnational, quiet, or what you call the actors in the periphery, right? If you go by, if you go by just theories, then it is a purely state-centric theories. Two states would negotiate, right? But in case of in case of Nepal and India, it is not Delhi and Kathmandu, right? It is to a large extent. Bihar government and some provinces of Nepal. It is something like the, the farmers of Nepal and the farmers of Bihar, right? It is something like the disaster management authority in Bihar and disaster, disaster management authority on the other side of the border in Nepal. So this kind of actors, this kind of sub-regional actors are not taken really fully right into considerations by what you call the standard theoretical discourse. So therefore, I would like to say that in the social sciences research, particularly when we are doing research which are of high social relevance, high policy relevance, and I think we, 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 we should try and go beyond theories and if possible supplement the theoretical understanding by developing your own conceptual understanding of the situations. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That was a thought provoking speech. Never before have I thought about the rigidity surrounding a theory. I also sincerely hope that we someday become a more influential forward. I uh, now call upon our student convener, Kiran GSK, to deliver the vote of thanks. So yes. I, I, I ended 20 minutes before yes. thinking that there will be some questions, right? There are questions, sir. That's what I wanted to tell you. There are questions.
Sir, can't hear you. Yeah. Sir, I have a question. Uh, when you are talking about you know water sharing and all, uh, do you think that the Kaveri water dispute between say it's not international, right? It is within. Uh, so in that case also we should go beyond the theories and. So what is your take on that? Thank you. See the Kaveri water dispute can be looked into from uh, three different theoretical angles. First is uh, just theories of water sharing. Then the second theory would be that of conflict. And third is, the, is uh, something related to legal constitutional issues. Right? And in case of, so you have similar kind of situations. Right? You have layers and layers of conflict. You can see, uh, as far as water is concerned, you have a conflict with the neighboring countries. You have conflict within the country between two states. You have conflict within the communities. You have a conflict between two villages. All kinds of layers and layers of conflicts. This is why. But if you get into the pure theories of conflicts, right? These theories of conflicts may not really capture the deeper complex nuances of the water related conflicts. You have conflicts, right? Which theory can capture that a, a, a kind of a, a, a kind of a Dalit would not be allowed to drink water or bring shared water from a, a, the same tube well in a particular society? What, which theory of what? But this is a conflict within a village. This is a conflict within a community, right? Now, now, question here is, you compare this particular conflict with a conflict between India and Pakistan on Indus, India and China, as far as Brahmaputra is concerned, right? Where two states are involved and you come down to a deeper, deeper micro level conflict where you have a caste, particular caste within a particular community and a village would have also a conflictual dynamics. That's why, so, so if you look into the theories, all these are covered by what you call it conflicts, a theory of conflict. But the nature of the conflict, the complexity of the conflict, Right. Of course, sociology, social, sociologists will have its own way of describing it. The political scientists would have its own way of describing it. But when it comes to really bringing interdisciplinarity in explaining this kind of conflicts at a fairly micro level, right, and, and at the macro level, at the, at the international level, you don't have one single theory to explain this. So you will have to go to sociologists to understand this. You will have possibly to go to an expert on, uh, you know, health-related issues, expert on what you call it, grand panchayats to do this. So it is very challenging for all of us to understand because the 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 at the core of the conflict is of course dispute. But when you explain the nature of the conflict, right? When you explain, expand the origin of the conflict, then it is the power of the state in one case. And it is a power of a particular community to deprive other communities in a particular village. How do you define this power? How do you define this hegemonic behavior, right? in a fine kind of theoretical context, precisely because this is also a conflict, more or less a conflict, a, a kind of a dispute. Uh. Uh, good afternoon, sir. So this, um, yes, uh, so theorizing, you know, real uh, 
or reality, something like, you know, imagine communities, uh, which was done by Bennett Anderson, and you talk about soft borders, or you have uh, the concept of uh, Jomia by James Scott. Now, the, the, the situation that emerges out of it is, you know, you, you, uh, you, these again uh, results in conflicts. So, uh, you know, uh, in some cases it becomes that you do, you do not theorize certain situations maybe, or, uh, you know, is theory uh, uh, sort of, you know, all pervasive and uh, it is uh, omnipotent and omnipresent. How do we consider it? It is difficult to theorize it precisely because situation becomes so complex and it is so varied. Say, for example, how do you theorize a situation? The moment you say cooperations, that means you will have to uh, you will have to sacrifice something which was absolutely yours till yesterday, right? Say, for example. When we talk about cooperation in, uh, in, in, in water sector between India and Nepal, uh, yes, till yesterday, Nepal had an absolute control over its water. And today, the moment you enter into a cooperation dynamics with India, it has to share, right? And uh, the moment you start sharing it, it impinges upon what Nepal thinks about its national power and national security. Till yesterday, I had an absolute power, absolute sovereignty about on my water, but today I am surrendering it, right? And the moment you say that, uh, you tend to withdraw from the cooperation phenomenon precisely because I don't want to lose my identity or national sovereignty. But that is Nepal. Look at India. A small country like Nepal, a small country like Bhutan, behave in such a manner where it would think that it would lose its, its way, it would erode its national sovereignty if it cooperates. But look at India. India does absolutely the same thing. A big country, right? India does it vis-a-vis -vis, uh, possibly Indus, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Pakistan, possibly vis-a-vis -vis Bangladesh. So if you try to theorize this, right, your if you try to theorize this, saying that this is a small country phenomenon, right? And this is a, a, the phenomenon that basically is driven by identity-based sovereignty, right? It clashes immediately in, when you try to bring this theory as far as India is concerned. Big country, no worries about its sovereignty as far as smaller countries are concerned. That is why in the in the in the in the in the academics, uh, particularly when we bring, uh, particularly when we try to bring Western theoretical underpinnings and discourses, we need to be absolutely very very not only careful but also to be very very cautious uh, in, in doing so. So we have a question from Lucky. The question reads, what is the role of civil society organization in hydro diplomacy? Because we see that in South Asia, track one diplomacy has delivered limited results. Well, this is a very interesting question uh, because uh, civil society is uh, coming out to be a very, very important factor in the entire negotiation process because uh, Two, three very interesting thing about civil society is the cross-border networking of civil society is much stronger than that of the government. One. Secondly, uh, civil society uh, does not really take into consideration only the governmental point of view. It takes into consideration much, much larger point of view. And thirdly, civil society uh, is 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 supposed to be a kind of a a kind of a barometer of public sentiments or what people want 
right? Unlike uh, to a large extent, even elected government. Therefore, civil society is very, very important. But in no negotiations, in no hydro diplomacy, right? Uh, we we see a strong inclusion of civil society interest and civil society uh, partners. That is why. Uh, that is why now you have a cause in IIT Gawati on hydro diplomacy, right? That is why in Sikkim uh, we have introduced this cause in on hydro diplomacy. Pondicherry would like to replicate these causes in what you call it neighboring countries also, so that you have a much much larger stakeholding as far as negotiations are concerned. Uh, in hydro diplomacy, right? In the, in the in the entire negotiation process, where is the where where where, where is, how does a farmer, right, gets his expression in the entire hydro diplomacy project, right? It is done somewhere from Delhi, right? It is done somewhere from uh, Islamabad, right? Where does the 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 nuances the interest of real stakeholders like farmers come into being. And this is where we need to really strengthen institutions that would train hydro diplomats, right? Not exactly the foreign service officers in any in, in, in these countries, but diplomats in real sense of the term that you have representatives of number of stakeholders the farmers, including what you call the other water users uh, in, in, in the community and in the state. We have another question that is from Sridhar, and it is a two-part question. It reads, if we look at South Asia from the institutional lens of SARC, regional cooperation term seems like a failure. However, in recent times, Beamstech has attained a considerable level of success, even though it's an institution at the nascent stage. Isn't it then the rivalry between India and Pakistan that is the reason for SAC's failure? The second part of this question. Does that not validate realism as a theoretical position, which naturalizes conflict between states to expand their respective interests, which in this case has led to the failure of SAC and a potential success of Beamstech? I don't think uh, Beamstake has uh, made substantive progress. My, we keep questioning India's postures as far as regionalism is concerned. Everybody expects India to do India to be a pivot. When India initiated the SARC process, everybody thought it is India which would take it forward. Right, and when India initiated the Beamstech process, everybody thought that it is India which would lead the process. But somewhere we have failed. Look at SARC today. Right, I think uh, the SARC summit last took place. The 18th SARC summit happened almost uh, almost seven years back. For last seven years, we do not have the SARC summit, and one. Major factor, or I will say the only factor why it has not been held is precisely because India does not want to hold it. Right? It is such a dominant partner, it doesn't want to hold it. Look what happened in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is essentially our problem. Afghanistan is a member of SARC. Afghanistan is in South Asia. But where is Afghanistan discussed in South Asia? Tell me, Afghanistan is discussed somewhere in Middle East. Somewhere in the US, somewhere in Russia, somewhere in China, right? But where is Afghanistan South Asia? Except the meeting organized by the National Security Advisor in India day before yesterday, nothing. Whereas we thought that the best forum for discussion on what is happening in Afghanistan would be SARC, right? As we discussed in the last uh, many, many years. Therefore, we have somehow lagged behind. Uh, there is no Pakistan in in Bimstek, right? There is no Pakistan in BBIM. 
There is no Pakistan in greater the Ganga Mekong cooperation. Right? This is only India. That means what? That means that means that means India is not able to really push it forward. Right? Any of these projects. Whereas every everyone wants India to be a pivot. And indifference of India in the regional projects like this has created space for a country which is outside the region historically, that is China. Because China everywhere in Pakistan, in Nepal, in Bangladesh, you know, the trade, the, the, the quantum of trade of China with Pakistan with India, with Bangladesh, with Myanmar, unimaginable, the growth rate. How do you explain this? This is, this is basically India's uh, periphery. This is, India is the central actor in the, in the, but as a central actor, somewhere we miss the point. That is why I'm saying the theoretical model which we try to bring in our process, that integration model, we just brought it without even thinking whether this would be relevant to South Asia or not. Right? As a result of which, this is the this is the situation we are facing today. Therefore, I think as academics, as scholars, one of our one of our major contributions would be to provide alternatives to various governments in the thinking process, in the models, in the growth process. Do you get it? One of, this is what we have been, this is what we try to do in many of the Northeastern states. I was asked to prepare the vision document for Northeastern states by Niti Ayo 2035. And exactly, we have, we have put all these issues together that this is a, this is a reason which requires reverse integration. Theoretically, conceptually, what you have been saying is, look, Northeast should integrate with the rest of India. Why? Nobody explains. Why all the projects in the Northeast regions have to undergo, have to, have to go through the security labs? Why? Nobody explains this. Why there is a hegemonic discourse about Northeast being a laggard, Northeast being a place of violence, Northeast being a place of instability. I, we don't understand this. And so, the, so the people use theories to explain this, but we don't want, we want now a reverse integration. Let rest of India integrate with Northeast. You see the map, you see the map of India, right? Let me take two minutes more, Professor. Let me look at look at the let's let's when we talk about reverse integration, look at the map of India. In the map of India, northeast is connected with the rest of India through a chicken neck, and the chicken's head is northeast India, and the chicken's body is rest of India. You have seen that. And theoretically, conceptually, hegemonic uh, thinking wise. Narratives wise, so far the body actually directed the head. Because you always said that uh, we should integrate with the rest of India. And that is why the situation is so complex today. When body drives the head, what would happen? Right? So we are saying that you integrate you 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 reverse the integration process, let head drive the body. And when head drives the body, let head be actually talking about India's activist policy. Let head lead the India's activist policy narratives. Let head lead the entire development discourse as a growth pole in India's activist policy. This is what I'm saying. It's a difficult thing. Because narratives wise, theory wise, you have a mindset now. Two generations, three generations have a mindset now that we will have to integrate with the rest of India. And we are now questioning that no, this is wrong. And, 
and it is so very difficult to change the entire narrative and the concepts. Therefore, I would suggest that an institution like IIT and scholars, bright scholars you have there says, let's start questioning which were not questioned, which were apparently wrong, yet not questioned. Right? Therefore, this is the beauty of all of us. And as, as researchers, we can question. We are free to question. We are not bureaucrats. We are not politicians. We are absolutely free to question using our own judgment. Thank you. We have two more questions, but since we're almost, uh, if that's okay with you. So shall I go ahead with the question? Yeah, yeah, please, please. Okay, so the question is from Rohit, uh, and it reads, what are the problems associated with the involvement of a third party organization in mediating water disputes? And the next question, if I might read it out now, is from Saurav, and it reads, since you've mentioned the disputes at various levels and how various disciplines may have varying perspectives, I would like you to comment on the importance of the interdisciplinary interdisciplinarity as a way to move away from the orthodoxy in framing theories. Good questions. You see, the third party involvement in the diplomacy, again, 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 a kind of a given narrative, again, kind of a given institutionalized practice that the negotiation has to be done by a state and the agents of the state only, right? Come what may, let it be absolutely a great success or let, let it be absolutely a total failure, but it has to be negotiated by the state. Now, this is where our role comes as academics. We should be able to tell that, look, in the negotiation process, we have found these three actors are very, very critical. And these three actors have to be involved in the negotiation process, or if not involved, they must be, they must be consulted adequately in the negotiation process. Right? And that is how channels are opened. That is how scope is widened. And that is how instruments and agencies are strengthened. And we haven't done that precisely because we academics have started for, for long. We worked purely and, uh, and exclusively outside what you call the domain of policies. That should not be the case anymore. The more you work as per, on, on issues involving policies on any issue, right? The more uh, you will have a role to play in the decision making process. Now, the second question about interdisciplinarity is very, very vital. And I, in, 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 in fact, my entire three examples of all the three issues which I gave today is is this in the underlying principle in the entire acceptance of a theoretical uh, underpinning or non-acceptance or widening of a theoretical underpinning is actually driven by interdisciplinarity. It's so complex. It's so complex, right? On as I I gave you a special example of human security and national security. You please, if you find time, please read a book of mine on human security in India, Discourses and Challenges, right? Where I have uh, said very, very specifically that human insecurities have killed many, many times more than the national insecurity. Yet, we do not really take human insecurities Right. 
hunger deaths, the malnutrition part of it, the, the individual security part of it, literacy part of it, the health part. Look at pandemic last time. When a situation was there as if there is no state, there was there is no government. Right in a pandemic, this was a serious, serious national security concern for us. Such a serious, serious national security concern for us. Therefore, interdisciplinarity in approaching and in dealing with a particular issue is very, very critical now. The, 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 the idea of exclusive domain in, in, a, in, in, a, in, in the treatment of a particular issue or an exclusive discipline is no longer relevant, I must say. It's no longer relevant. Therefore, it's our call in the academics to really widen the entire thinking and the treatment process. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. That was a spirited discussion session. I would now like to call the head of our department, Professor Sukanya Sharma, to say a few words. Oh, we can't hear you. The audio gets turned on in the microphone here and it is there in my ears, but I miss you. Uh, we are like, you know, sitting in the inside a hall. And uh, yes, of course, there is virtual. So we are semi virtual state uh, where we have some people out, you know, connected through uh, uh, online. And then we also have, you know, in a hall, uh, students sitting in front of us today after a long break. Uh, this is, you know, the first time that we have been able to do this in a hybrid mode. So the uh, online uh, graduate research meet has been on a hybrid mode, in fact, and we have made it work. So it's like, you know, uh, uh, this uh, Cisco WebEx, then we have uh, the YouTube presence, and we also have strong physical presence. And uh, that's real motivation. But uh, taking on from your talk, uh, yes, as you said, you have opened up many new issues and concepts uh, where, uh, our students, uh, you know, working in so many areas, as you have seen the questions, uh, uh, would, you know, uh, would like to uh, dwell in, and I'm sure it, it'll, you know, set their thoughts, uh, you know, running after this uh, with, with the GRM, you know, the end of the GRM. Uh, this was, in fact, a very, very good ending to our uh, two-day uh, exercise, uh, where we end with this very, um, motivating, um, uh, you know, academic discourse uh, about uh, on beyond theories, where, you know, it is about uh, uh, more about problems and issues uh, which are beyond or, you know, within theories, they, the concepts, the theories cannot handle them, but it is our own uh, efforts uh, as academics uh, to find out solutions uh, to these problems, which may not cater to uh, theories, but that should not be a hindrance to uh, what you are trying to do. So um, yes, uh, uh, we will take on from uh, here, sir, and you know, uh, that would be a real uh, uh, sort of, you know, takeaway uh, from the from this GRM. And uh, we would like to invite you uh, here. So whenever the situation turns uh, normal, and you know, in the sense that it, it's normal, but in you know, a physical presence uh, would be also uh, like what it was two years back. Uh, it would be, you know, our, uh, our, our privilege to uh, see you in the campus here. And uh, we would take, uh, take the opportunity sometimes to invite you uh, to come and interact uh, with our students and our, the faculty members of the department once again. And thank you uh, for agreeing to, you know, give this talk and uh, giving this, you know, wonderful uh, insights into uh, the various ways by which academics can actually deal, deal with reality. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the Sadbaju and uh, Mithilesh Zazu and the great uh, Professor Sharma. Thank you very much and all the participants. Good luck. All the best. Thank you.
Thank you, ma'am. I would now like to invite our student convener, Kiran GSK, to deliver the word of thanks. Thanks, Nikita. A very good afternoon to all. It's my privilege to be standing here amongst you all to deliver the vote of thanks. The graduate research meet, though has come to an end, couldn't have been possible without the entire team working day in and day out since last couple of months. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Professor Mahendra P. Lama, who despite his busy schedule, accepted to illuminate us with topic so relevant in these times. Professor Madhura Swaminathan for opening the session and setting the tone for the event. I would also like to thank Professor T.G. Sitaram, Director, IIT Guwahati, for his constant support and encouragement. Professor Sukanya Sharma, Head of the Department, who was resolute on having the GRM this year after having lost year to the pandemic. It was our constant words of encouragement and determination which made this event fruitful. A huge thank you to all the presenters and their insightful presentations which opened doors to further questions and discussions. I thank the faculty advisors of GRM, Professor Swamiya Ray, Professor Sambit Malik, Professor Debashi Das, Dr. Bodhisattva Sen Gupta, Dr. Prasad Prasad, Dr. Vasundra Jairath, Dr. Vitlesh Kumar Jha, Dr. Deva Priya Basu, and Dr. Amar Jyoti Mahanta, who have come together to support this meet in many generous ways, thinking with us, advising us, reading endless drafts and being with us right throughout. I would like to acknowledge our office staff, Para Kalita, Durga Sharma, Kontai Basumatari, Rubul Gogai, and members of HSS department who have been constant in advising and bettering our efforts to render this event a success. I cannot do without thanking the members of Com Computer and Communication Center, especially Sailendra Pathak and Kalol Barua, IIT Guwahati, who have tremendously helped us with the technical and back-end support. I would also like to thank the staff who helped us with smoothly managing the hospitality of the conference center. Most part of the work leading to the meet happened within the various GRM committees. And the event was fruitful because the committees have toiled hard, standing rock solid with each other. I thank the technical controls headed by Rohit and team, Mimika Mukherjee, Ashish Chauhan, Lucky Nara and Bharatwaj, Upasna Hazarika, Anindya Basak, Aditi Sharma, Prashanjit Barek, Prashanta Kumar Aruka, Navna Dinkar, Rahul Kumar Singh, and Kago Kevin. Moderating headed by Upasna Chetri and team, Chobiel Alex, Snigda Mohana, Alakriti Muskar, Tara Baburaj, Simran Gupta, Nisha Nishiyadav, Chai Smita Deka, Ishan Harit, Anirban Mukherjee, and Vedanta Dihingya. The hall management, headed by Mohammad Nasir Kurshet and team, Pranamika Doimari, Haling Kipgen, Emi, Rosie, Lika, Tridip Mukherjee, Abhipsa Satpati, Parnali Rao, Triti Madhata, Shatoki Mukherjee, Thomas Kuriakos, Iron George, Shilpa Krishnan, and Tushar Chetruveti. The abstract team, headed by NS Abhilasha and team, Shilpa Chaya Majumdar, Saurav NG, Raj Kumar Hemjet, and Vernon T. Melo. I also thank Chainika Barua, Swagata, Bez Barua, and Sonia Kamai. I'd also like to thank Hali Hussain, Sambasivaredi, Smriti Reka, Ajay Salunke, Ritika Katri, Tulika Rani Talukdar, Shivanki Gupta, Tiraj Paleri, Daipandar, and G. J. R. I also owe much to the hard work and brilliance of previous organizers who have immensely con contributed to the GRM pages. I apologize if I missed out any on names by mistake. I sincerely hope that the upcoming GRMs are conducted offline in this crawling and pleasing campus of IIT Guwahati. I once again thank you all for being with us throughout. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We thank the GSK for taking it. The first two days when I talked with him, he was stammering, he was almost in a way.
I'm sure in the corridors when you saw me those days, you thought I was quite a monster. <laughs> it was wonderful today that he comes up. Should actually be a bit less <laughs> But it's uh,